Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah wassalatu wassalamu ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Brothers and sisters in Islam, we continue our discussion like I mentioned in the group about the uh, especially the two hadith uh, concerning the uh, what do you call it the creation of the seven heavens or the nature of the seven heavens themselves. All right, and those two hadith are the, the first two hadith in this slide here that I show you just now are uh, here in this slide. Uh, there are actually three hadith that I quoted in my book that talks about uh, these three hadith uh, talk about uh, the seven heavens. Now, the problematic hadith are the first and the second hadith. There is the hadith narrated by Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu and reported by uh, at tirmidhi uh, and, you, and uh, also Ahmad bin Hanbal. And the second hadith narrated by uh, Sayyidina Al-Abbas radiallahu anhu and reported by Abu Dawud ibn Majah, Tirmidhi and Ahmad bin Hanbal. Now, these two hadith are quite problematic, um, like I shared with you last week. But the third hadith, or the hadith of Israel Mi'raj, now this hadith is beyond any doubt on its authenticity. Because it is recorded, was recorded by many scholars of hadith, and uh, it was narrated by many companions. So many scholars of hadith took it from many companions, and it can be found in the uh, books of uh, both Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. So its authenticity can be vouched. <coughs> so we don't need to discuss more on the third hadith. Now the first two hadiths we're going to discuss tonight. Okay, let us just go through again uh, those uh, first two hadith. Uh, the hadith of Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu, Abu Hurairah said, right, uh, in this hadith, once when the Prophet Sallallahu was sitting with his companions, a cloud came over them. The Prophet Sallallahu asked his companions, do you all know what is that? And they answered, only Allah and his Prophet know. Then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, there is a cloud that give that the giver of water for earth. Allah sent it to a group of people who do not express gratitude to him, nor do they pray to him. And do you know what is above you? And they answered, only Allah and his prophet know. Now the Prophet Sallallahu then said, it is, ar it is ar raqiyah that is the first layer of heaven, a protected roof, and a wave prevented from falling on earth. Do you know what's the distance between you and the first heaven? That is the protected roof, the blue thing that we can see up there. And of course, the companion said, only Allah and his prophet know. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, between it and you is a distance of 500 years of travel. Now, do you know what is above it? And of course, they answered, only Allah and his prophet know. And then the Prophet Sallallahu said, above it are two heavens. The distance between them is 500 years of travel. So this is earth. This is the, uh, the age of the, uh, what do you call it? The first heaven, then the second heaven, and then... Uh, what do you call it? The age of the third heaven. So above it are two heavens, the second heaven and the third heaven, right? The door to the third heaven. So it is it is in layers, lah. Uh, if you look, if you can understand from this hadith, right? And so the Prophet Sallallahu said, the distance between this first heaven, uh, the start of the first heaven and the start of the second heaven is the 500 years of travel. And the Prophet Sallallahu continued, uh, repeating it right, until the seven heavens and the distance between all the two heavens, between the sixth and the seventh, between the fifth and the sixth, between the fourth and the fifth, all of them, the distance is between the earth and the first heaven, which is 500 years of travel. Now, the Prophet Sallallahu asked again, do you know what is above all of them? And the companion said, only Allah and his prophet know. And the Prophet Sallallahu said, above them is the throne. And the distance between it and the heaven is like the distance between two layers of heaven. Right? And so above the seven heavens is a throne. And then the distance between the start of the seven heavens and the start of the throne, Arash, is 500 years of travel. And do you know what is under you? And the Prophet asked the companion, what is under us? And then the, the companion say, uh, answered only Allah and his Prophet, no. Then the Prophet said, it is earth. And do you know what is under it? And then they answered only Allah and his prophet, no. The Prophet Sallallahu said, under it is another earth. The distance between our earth, that is our ground, to the, to the ground of the first earth is the 500 years of travel, just like the heavens. And the Prophet Sallallahu continued until he counted seven heavens. Now the distance between two heavens is 500 years of travel. 
right? By the entity of whom the life of Muhammad is in his hands, if you lower a man with a rope to the lowest earth, he will, decide, he will descend on God. The Prophet ﷺ then recited the verse, he is the first and the last, the evident and the imminent. In his full knowledge of all things, the verse in Surah Al Hadid, verse 3. So, this is the verse, this is, sorry, this is the hadith of Abu Hurairah, allegedly right, narrated by Abu Hurairah from the Prophet. Now, the second hadith, which is the hadith of Al Abbas, uh, and Al Abbas, uh, the Prophet's uncle, said, I was at Al Badha. Now, Al Badha is a place which is on the outskirts of Mecca, like I shared with you last week, right? And uh, Al Abbas said, I was with the group of people, among them the Prophet. Wasallam. Then the cloud came over us, and the Prophet looked at it and asked, What do you call this? And all of them said, Cloud. Then the Prophet Wasallam said, It is also called Al Muzun. And they also said, Al Muzun. Then the Prophet Wasallam said, It is also called Al Anan. And they all said al -anan. And then the Prophet Wasallam then asked, Do you know the distance between heaven and earth? They answered, We do not know. Now the Prophet Wasallam said, The distance between both of them is either 71, 72, or 73 years. And the next day of heaven is like that. I think the Prophet Wasallam counted seven heavens. And above the seventh layer is an ocean of which the depth is the distance between the layer of the heaven to the next layer. And the above it are eight angels. Right. Above the seventh heaven is an ocean. Above that ocean, right, are eight angels in the shape of deer. And then the distance between its hoof, the deer's hoof, and its knee, there's an angel itself, right? Uh, the angel's hoof and the angel's knee is like the distance between the layer of heaven and the next, which is 72, 71, 73 uh, years of travel. On their backs is a throne. So the back of the angels, which is the shape of deers. Right, it's a throne, the Arash. And the thickness of the throne, which is like between heaven and to another heaven, which is 71, 72, 73 years of travel. And then God is above the throne. Right? Now, these two hadith are problematic. In two aspects. Now, if we want to analyze hadith, right, the scholars of hadith always analyze hadith from two angles or two aspects. Number one, the scholars analyze the hadith from its own chain of narration, okay, which is called the sanat. Is the sanat sound? Is the sanat acceptable? Or is the sanat problematic? Are there any narrators in that chain of, of narration? Any of those narrators, we call it the any of the rawi in that sanat, right? Uh, any of them problematic, accused of being a liar before? or uh, someone who's forgetful, or someone who, who has not much knowledge, or someone who uh, is not that close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or who commit maqsiyah often, right? If those people are there, then that chain of narration for that hadith is problematic. So, first and foremost, the scholars, right? And this is the traditional approach. The scholars will analyze the chain of narration. If the chain of narration is problematic, then they look at the what they call it the content of the hadith itself right so that is the second aspect so they look at the chain of narration of the hadith and they look at the hadith itself the content of the hadith now if the chain is sound right therefore the content is also sound right it's also sound it's acceptable right because the chain is okay just like uh, the narration uh, of uh, all the narrations of hadith that, that can be found in the hadith uh, in the book of Sahih Bukhari. So they are sound. Okay? But if the chain of narration is problematic, then we look at the content itself. It's the second study. Now, the content, if the content can be supported by other hadith, which has no problem on its chain of narration. Therefore, this content can be accepted. Why? Because it is supported by another hadith which is considered as acceptable. Okay? But if this content 
is supported or mentioned in another hadith with a chain of narration that is also problematic, then the scholars of hadith look for the third evidence, the third supporting hadith. Can they find the, the third hadith that supports these two problematic hadith? If they can't find it, then they said both this hadith, right, in its two aspects, the chain of narration and the content is problematic. Both hadiths are problematic. Okay. Now, if they can find a supporting hadith from the third and fourth hadith, if those third and fourth hadith have authentic or sound chain of narration, then the whole family of hadith that talks about the same thing, the same message, the whole of this hadith, the hadith number one, number two, number three, number four, all of them are accepted. Right? So it is authentic, only that the first two hadith narrated by people who are problematic, but the, 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 the content is the same because it's supported by another hadith that has a sound chain of narration. Now, if let's say the third and the fourth hadith are right, also problematic in this chain of narration, the whole of this hadith one, two, three, four, that talks about the same thing or the same message or the same event, right? All of them are uh, what do you call it as uh, has pro they have problematic chain of narration. So therefore, we'll say that uh, this whole hadith problematic. Okay, they are weak. They are weak in content. Now, if the scholars say that uh, the opinion of some scholars, right, especially Imam Nawawi and in Mazhab Shafi'i and Mazhab Hanafi, Mazhab Maliki, and some opinions Mazhab Hanbali, and they say that if, let's say, uh, all these hadith, right, that talks about the same thing, but all of them have weak chain of narration, but they are somehow, I mean, talk about the same thing. And the, the thing that they talk about, this study talk about is, is about uh, af, uh, afdalul a'mal or uh, what you call the virtues of, uh, of uh, ibadah the virtues of rituals, the virtues of, of prayers or whatever, ibadah, the virtues of it means that, for example, if you do this, then you get that. Now, this thing, doing this ibadah on a certain night or a certain day is very good. Or yeah, this du'a or this zikir should be recited. But, but the hadith that talks about this zikir or this ibadah, all of them are problematic right? from, the, from the point of point of view of their chain of narration. So most scholars say that, well, we can accept the hadith. Even though all of them have weak chain of narration, we can accept the hadith because there is a high probability, no, it's not a high probability, there is a probability that that hadith, all those hadith are authentic. It really came from the Prophet But even if it does not come from the Prophet Right, it does not do us any harm to follow that hadith because it won't affect our aqidah, our belief. Right, it actually just encourage us to do more ibadat, and that's it. But we never say that uh, this hadith, right, uh, all of them are problematic. Uh, we say that this is really it comes from the Prophet Sallallahu We should never say that, right, because we are not sure. Why well, I'm not sure because all their chain of narrations are problematic. Okay, so we say that probably it come from the Prophet and there's no harm for us to follow the content of the hadith because it does not affect our 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 belief, our aqidah. Uh, majority of scholars are of that opinion. Some minority of scholars said, no, 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 we want to be safe, even though those hadith talk about ibadah, talk about uh, ibadah sunnah something that is encouraged, not compulsory, right? Uh, even so, we want to maintain the purity of our, our, of, of our ibadah. So we do not want to uh, follow that hadith. Fine and dandy, no problem at all, right? So there are two opinions to it. But if the content talks about belief, aqidah, right? Now, if all of them are problematic in the chain of narration, 
then there is a very, very high possibility. We cannot say 100% because you never meet the Prophet Sallallahu But there is a high, very high possible, uh, uh, probability and possibility that those hadith or that particular hadith is a forged hadith. It does not come from Prophet Sallallahu But even if it comes from the Prophet Sallallahu we do not know whether it really comes from There's a high probability it does not come. But there's a very, very small chance that it really comes from the Prophet Sallallahu But even so, we say we do not want to practice on it, take it, believe it. Why? Because it concerns our Akidah, our, our, our belief system. And anything that comes that, that concerns our belief system must come from source, sources that are authentic, that we can really trust, that we have a very, very high confidence or even 100% confidence that those hadith are authentic. If there's a slightest doubt on the authenticity of that hadith, it is safer for us not to accept the hadith because it affects our, our, our belief system. What if? What if that hadith is a forged hadith? And then we take it as, okay, we can accept it. Lah. Uh, just like we accept the hadith that is weak, that concerns ibadat, that is encouraged sunnah. So we accept a weak hadith that talks about a belief system. What, what if that hadith is wrong? That hadith does not come from the Prophet Wasallam, but it was a forged hadith. It was a created hadith. It was a false hadith. And then we believe something that is false, that concerns our our belief system, our akidah, and that is very risky, right? It will affect our iman. Uh, so to be safe, we say that, okay, we're not going to accept that because it won't affect the core belief of us. Our core belief as Muslim remains intact, right? All these are additional belief, all right? Now, that is exactly the same situation that we can find for these two hadith, right? The hadith of Abu Hurairah, and the hadith of Al Abbas. Both of them have problematic chain of narration. Both of them talk about the same thing, right? Which is what the Prophet relate to them about uh, what is above them and what is below them. But then the content differ a little bit. It talks about the same thing, but both hadith have the have weak chain of narration, problematic change of a chain of narration, problematic sanad. And these two hadith concern our belief system, akhidah, because we have to believe what is up there, what is where this arash, uh, the shape of the angels and so forth, the distance between heaven to heaven, all these are belief, not, it does not concern ibadah. So, going with that opinion of the scholars, these two hadith, problematic in chain of narration, right? And concerning ibadah, and no corroboration, no supporting hadith, authentic hadith. There's no supporting authentic hadith for this two chain of narration. Therefore, it is safe for us to not accept the two hadith. Okay. So that is in a nutshell. Before we go deeper into the what you call it, the uh, uh, analysis of these two hadith. In a nutshell, these two hadith very problematic, and therefore it is safer for us not to consider these two hadith as part of our belief system, as part of our uh, akidah. Now we go to the analysis of these two hadith, right? Let's talk about the hadith of Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu. In my book, I, I, I elaborated right in detail the problems of uh, this hadith change of narration or sanad but uh, in summary right this hadith of abu hurairah it has one narrator by the name of al hasan bin yasar now al hasan bin yasar is considered as trustworthy actually it is thicker and Hassan bin Yasar accepted by Imam Bukhari and Muslim in their compilation of Sahih Hadith. So you can find this narrator in some of the Hadith, Imam Al-Bukhari and Imam Muslim. However, this is the caveat, the very strong caveat. Imam At-Tirmidhi said that Al-Hassan bin Yasar, who was a tabi'in, the follower of the companions, 
According to Imam Tirmidhi, Al Hasan did not hear any hadith directly from Abu Hurairah radhiyallahu anhu. In other words, Abu uh, in other words, Al Hasan never met Abu Hurairah radhiyallahu anhu in his lifetime, and therefore never takes any hadith from Abu Hurairah radhiyallahu anhu. But in this hadith of Abu Hurairah, Al Hasan said that I took it from Abu Hurairah. So the chain of narration is that from Al Hasan, from Abu Hurairah, from Rasulullah SAW. So it goes from Rasulullah SAW to Abu Hurairah to Al Hasan. But according to Tirmidhi, Al Hasan never meet Abu Hurairah, never take hadith from Abu Hurairah. So how can he narrate a hadith from Abu Hurairah direct? He should be. He should say that I take for someone else, and that someone else takes from Abu Hurairah. But he never mentions it. Ah, so that is one big question mark. Now, I went through uh, all the books of Hadith, right? All the nine books of Hadith, right? Uh, Tirmidhi, uh, Ibn Majah, An Nasai, uh, Ahmad bin Hanbal. Of course, I use Sofes lah, right? Uh, uh, Ad to find this narrator Al Hassan bin Yasar, did he actually in any of those hadith that can be found in all the books of of hadith, the nine books of hadith that are accepted, right, uh, by scholars, did Al Hassan take any hadith direct from Abu Hurairah? I found none, zero. There is no hadith that Al Hassan took it direct from Abu Hurairah. That's number one. Okay. But this hadith, of course, this one not narrated by, by what you call it, uh, Imam Bukhari, right? Uh, Imam Bukhari, I found out, right, in Imam al-Bukhari, when he and Imam Muslim also, when both of them narrated hadith from Al-Hasan, or in their chain of narration contains Al Hassan and Al Hassan took it from someone else, and then that some that companion took it from the Prophet. Both of them uh, were being very careful. They always give another hadith. Sorry, they give the same hadith that was narrated by uh, Al Hassan, right? But they give another hadith with another change of narration, with another sanad which is reliable as a supporting hadith to the hadith narrated by al Hasan. So in other words, Imam al-Bukhari Muslim, right, they did not put 100% trust on al Hasan. If they put 100% trust on al Hasan, they will never make an effort to support the hadith of al Hasan with another chain of narration, which is more reliable and non-questionable. Uh, so al Hasan bin Yasar, in this uh, chain of narration of Abu Hurairah hadith, right, uh, caused the whole hadith chain of narration sanad to be problematic. Therefore, right, the authenticity of this hadith of Abu Hurairah is in doubt. What more, right, if we look at the content of the hadith itself, the content of a hadith itself is problematic because it does not reflect reality. It reflects the ancient people understanding of what the heaven is all about or what is the blue skies up there, right? And that is the understanding of those people during the time of the Prophet Wasallam, and immediately after the Prophet or before the Prophet during that time, right? Uh, is considered as something that is, something that is uh, problematic with the reality, because to them, the blue sky is just like one roof. Okay, they can be broken into pieces and fall down upon us. And this blue roof is high above us. Uh, we do not know how high that is, right? Uh, so therefore, in this hadith, it's 500 years of travel. And 500 years of travel, like I shared with you, is more than the distance between us and the moon, right? Uh, even it might be way beyond Mars. It might be that. Uh, so it's just a fantastic 
figure, right, uh, given by someone, and it might be, right, most probably, I don't see 100% guaranteed, but, but I have this uh, almost, uh, I mean, it is my belief that this hadith is a forged hadith, right? Uh, some people created this hadith according to that person's understanding of what that sky is all about, the blue sky is all about. So for them, there's the first heaven. And after that, second heaven, third heaven. And they're following the Aristotelian, uh, what you call it, structure of, of the universe. Because according to Aristotelian system of the universe, the earth is at the center. And then the first layer of heaven, right, is uh, the moon. And right? the second layer of heaven is Mercury. And then after that, the third layer is Venus. And the fourth layer is the sun. And then the fifth layer is Mars. The sixth layer is Jupiter. And the seventh layer is Saturn and Desit. Because the planet Uranus and Neptune cannot be seen by naked eye. They have to use, we have to use telescope to observe them. Right? So they, as far as the naked eye can see, we can only see the furthest planet, which is Saturn. So seven heavens for them, Aristotelian. And beyond the seven heavens for the Aristotelian system, are the, uh, the, the, uh, it, it is the domain of the gods. Right? It is the perfect place. That is, we have, went, we have gone through this uh, before in the first two lectures, right? Or, or the first three lectures when we talk about the uh, creation uh, myth of uh, the Greeks. Okay, so beyond the seven heaven, beyond Saturn, right, are the stars, domain of the stars, and the stars are the domain of the, of the gods, and that's why they worship stars, because stars for them are gods, right? Uh, so it's a perfect place. It is, uh, it is a domain for the fifth element, which is the perfect element, which is called ether. And uh, uh, the first four elements are the, the base elements, which is low quality elements. And those elements belong to earth. The four elements, according to them, are the fire, the wind, water, and earth. And these four elements mixed together cost human beings and all other creatures. So for them, we are created from four elements. We have fire inside us, we have wind inside us, and we have earth, and also we have, uh, what do you call it just now? Air. So, sorry, water, fire, earth, and wind. So this mixture cause temperament of different human beings, just like the Chinese believe in the yin and yang, right? If it is a balance, then it's okay. If it's more yin, then it is more, uh, uh, I mean, uh, effeminate if it is young then it's or is it the opposite way right uh, it is more masculine and therefore it's like that so it, it actually follows right uh the the greek uh, belief of what is up there this hadith of abu Huraira, now that is my belief right uh, that this hadith is watched because uh the uh, this chain of narration is problematic and the content itself is problematic does not reflect reality Right. What more, the Hadith Abu Hurairah talks about what is under us. Uh, what is under us? What is under us is another earth. And that is, of course, does not reflect reality. What is under us is still earth. And we know that's under us. Earth is just, uh, the, what is solid is just the crust. And under the crust is the uh, semi liquid thing, which is called the mantle. Right? And then under the mantle, and all the way down for thousands of kilometers, then we go to the to the core, which is the iron core, and that's it, right? The earth is a sphere. The belief of people back then, the earth is flat. So to have another earth and uh, uh, under us, and then another earth under that earth, and all the way down, and all of them are flat, that is okay for them, because the earth is flat. They even construct, I shared with you, uh, you can look at the initial videos, right? They even construct this view of the seven earth right all of them flat all of them flat just like hdv flats right with all those stories right we have seven stories of of uh, earth and then the sun rises from the east and as the sun rises from the east all these uh, earth one earth two sorry earth seven six five four three and one they can see the sun rises but the sun will then go above 
the first earth, which is our earth, and then we have our noon day. But those, uh, the uh, second, third, and all the seven earth under us, they will be in darkness because they will be blocked by the sun. The sun is above the first earth, right? Which is us. And then when the sun sets, and then we illuminate all the earth, which is nonsense, right? It does not reflect reality. This is a very simplistic, simplistic thinking. Uh, of, of the earth just based on the earth is flat, right? So this hadith talk about the earth that is flat and all the earth, all the seven earth under us. And that is, that does not reflect reality. It cannot come from the Prophet of Allah SWT who only spoke the truth, who only spoke what is inspired to him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala vouch for that, guarantee for that. In Surah An-Najm, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَى The Prophet sallallahu never says anything from his own nafs, from his own desire, from his own wishful thinking. In huwa illa wahyu yuha, everything that he, he said that comes out from his mouth, the hadith that comes out from his mouth, all of them are wahyu yuha, are all the revelation is inspired to the Prophet So all of them are truth. That's why we cannot have any doubt on the whatever the Prophet told us and informed us if that thing comes from hadith that is authentic. For example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, so, sorry, the Prophet wasallam mentioned that uh, the Jibril alayhi salam, right, uh, is so huge right uh it's bigger than the earth we accept why right? because it comes from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the hadith is authentic right uh and we can't verify whether it's it, it, we can't verify it physically because it's that uh, jibril alayhi salam is a metaphysical being uh, so we accept it without any question but this hadith no it's difficult to accept it because it talks about things that are not real things that are imaginary and exist in the imagination of people who exist during the time who live during the time of the prophet وسلم, that the earth is in layers and the earth is flat so by all accounts right the hadith abu hurairah who can be safely rejected right? it does not actually inform us on the reality of the seven heavens one more of the seven earth Okay, so that is the, uh, the what do you call it? The analysis, the critical analysis of Abu Raira Hadith. Now let's talk about Ibn Abbas Hadith. Now Ibn Abbas Hadith never talks about the seventh earth, but Ibn Abbas Hadith talk about oceans above the seventh heaven, and then eight angels in the shape of deers above that ocean, and above that angels, right, uh, uh, is the throne of Allah SWT. And above the throne is Allah SWT, as if Allah needs a place to recite. Now, you can see from the content itself, it's already problematic. It is against our belief system. Actually, it is against the pure uh, Tawheed, which is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is beyond place and time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not need any place and time. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not confined to any space. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not confined to time. Both space and time are creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So from the content itself, from the point of view of the content itself, it's already problematic. Now let's look at the chain of narration. Now the chain of narration of, sorry, it's not even Abbas. I got to uh, Al-Abbas. Okay, Al-Abbas Hadith. Now the chain of narration of Al-Abbas Hadith includes two narrators among the chain is Simak bin Harb and Abdullah bin Umairah. Now Simak bin, Harb, Simak bin Harb took the hadith from Abdullah bin Umairah, uh, Abdullah bin Umairah and Abdullah took it from Ahnaf. So three, okay, three narrators. These are the very important narrators in the chain of nation. The others are okay, but these three, they are, I mean, uh, some problems in it. Now the scholars of hadith do not regard highly the narrations of Simak. Right, so Simak is considered as weak. Uh, Yahya bin Ma'in, one of the greatest scholars of hadith during the time of uh, the companions, uh, sorry, the followers of the followers of the companions, the Tabi Tabi'in, he said that 
simak bin had narrated hadith that were not narrated by others by others it means that you see there are always some a strange hadith right they can only be found through simak it cannot be found from other narrators of hadith oh, if you look at hadith they are usually uh, corroborated by other other uh, narrators and, and companions and right, right. Uh, the companions might be one or maybe more but the narrators will always what they call it confirm each other so a particular hadith can be narrated by three or four chain of narrations but when it comes to simak hadith it's always one no other narrators right narrate the same content of hadith like simak did so there is a very high suspicion that uh, simak might we cannot accuse 100 right but there is a high possibility that simak created hadith it might be it might not be right it might be that he just accept the only hadith that other narrators uh, did not accept but uh, that is uh, very highly unlikely right uh, because a lot of scholars a lot of narrators right uh, during the early years of, of islamic history so that's why Yahya bin Ma'in, rahimahullah, the great scholar, the greatest scholar, the greatest scholar of hadith, uh, he actually do not uh, regard that much on the hadith of Simak. Okay, that's number one. Number two, the narrator called Abdullah bin Umairah. Now, Abdullah bin Umairah narrated this hadith of Al Abbas, and Abdullah bin Umairah actually not accepted by by hadith scholars. Is considered as someone that is uh, very problematic, very weak. In fact, Imam Al Bukhari outrightly rejected any hadith narrated by Abdullah bin Umairah who said that he took it from Ahnaf. In this hadith, right, hadith of Al Abbas, right, uh, the chain of narration goes this way: Simak took it from Abdullah, and Abdullah took it from Ahnaf. And Imam Bukhari said no. Right, any hadith narrated by Abdullah from Ahnaf, I will reject totally. Why? Because Abdullah never took it from Ahnaf. Uh, okay, Abdullah never took it from from Ahnaf. Now, who is this Ahnaf? So we have Abdullah is problematic. Abdullah said I took it from Ahnaf. Mubarak said no, he never meet Ahnaf or. Uh, they never uh, live in the same sphere of space and time. So it's impossible for, for Abdullah to take it from Anaf. He must have taken it from someone else, someone else. And uh, he hid that someone's name and he jumped directly to Ahnaf. It might be that that someone took it from Ahnaf. So that someone mentioned to Abdullah, oh, this hadith came from Ahnaf. For Abdullah skipped that person and said, oh, this come from Ahnaf direct. It happens in, in, in some hadith. Uh, uh, when you study of hadith, it is called in the science of hadith, it's called as uh, a tadlis or a hadith al, al mudallas, right? Uh, where uh, the narrator hit some other narrators because of the problem of that narrator. So, this person he wants his hadith to be accepted by others, and he knew if he, if he, uh, I mean, uh, uh, be truthful and say that I took it from A. E, everyone will reject his hadith. Why? Because everyone knows that A is problematic. So he knew that A is problematic, but A took it from B. So he said that I took it from B. He bypassed A. Now that is not truthful. right? That is not honest at all. And that in the science of hadith is called a tadlis. There are different types of tadlis. Actually, there are two types of tadlis. Right, we, we're not going to go into detail of the sciences of hadith. So uh, Imam Bukhari rejected outright any uh, narration of Abdullah from Ahnaf. And this hadith of Al-Abbas is Abdullah from Ahnaf. Now who is Ahnaf? Ahnaf is problematic because uh, nobody can, can, I mean, the scholars of hadith, they, they, they're really not sure who is this Ahnaf. Okay. Now, Ahnaf, there are actually three persons by the name of Ahnaf. They can be of, they can be the same person or they can be three different persons. Now, the first two persons, right, uh, sorry, the first Ahnaf is problematic. The second Ahnaf is a little bit acceptable. 
the third ahnaf is rejected outright. So are they the three per different person or one person? Because all of them narrated hadith for Malabbas. Aha, uh -huh. right? So now it's some, getting something interesting. Uh, so uh, according to uh, the, uh, what do you call it? The last greatest imam of hadith, the last greatest scholars of, uh, scholar of hadith, uh, who is, Ibn, his name is Ibn, Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, and some scholars of this hadith, other scholars of hadith considered him as on par with Imam al-Bukhari because he memorized close to half a million hadith. Uh, so uh, this uh, Imam Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani. So some call him as the, uh, what do you call it? Allah uh, uh, Muhammad. I forgot the name that given to him. Right, the title given to him, uh, but it's considered as very uh, on par with Imam Bukhari and the last greatest hadith of hadith, uh, latest, last greatest scholars of hadith. And after that, no more hadith scholars of like him. Nobody able to manage, nobody able to memorize, manage to memorize close to half a million hadith. Nobody. That is very, very special. Right. So according to Imam Ibn Hajar Asqalani, these three ahnafs, they are of the same person. And if they're the same person, then this ahnaf cannot be accepted at all. Why? Because this ahnaf right, uh, has been uh, considered as someone that should be ignored because he lived during the time of Jahiliya, right? And he was of the, of course, he opposed Islam. They're not sure when he became Muslim, right? Uh, but he uh, showed his enmity towards Islam before he became Muslim. Uh, so that is Ahnaf. Uh, so uh, we have three narrators of Hadith in the chain of narration of Al Abbas, and three of them consecutively Simak, Simak, uh, sorry, Simak took it from Abdullah, Abdullah took it from from Ahnaf and all three of them are problematic and therefore this Hadith of Al-Abbas is problematic. We can safely reject the authenticity of this Hadith. Furthermore, when we look at the content of the Hadith, it's very problematic. It is against our, our belief system, it's against our Tawheed, our Akhidah. That's number one, right? Now, number two, and this one I do not uh, mentioned in my, uh, uh, my my book, right? Uh, this hadith of Al Abbas, right? And Al Abbas in the hadith said that I was at Al Badha with a group of people. Al Badha was uh, is on the outskirt of Mecca. It means that this hadith, if this hadith, this hadith narrated by Al Abbas, it seems that the Prophet sallam narrated this hadith when he was in Mecca before migration. Before migration to Medina, and of course they were Muslims, right? So it was okay, right? If the Prophet Sallallahu there are a lot of hadith the Prophet Sallallahu narrated in Mecca, so it should be no problem at all. But the problem is Al Abbas. Why? Because this hadith Al Abbas said I was Al Abadha, which is in Mecca. So we assume that this hadith was narrated, was mentioned, was said by the Prophet Sallallahu before he migrated to Medina. Now Al Abbas did not embrace Islam until after the Battle of Badr, which happened and occurred on the second year of Hijrah. So in other words, if this hadith, Rasulullah mentioned in Mecca, Al-Abbas was still a non-Muslim. Now, Can you accept an narration of a non-Muslim? What business he did, he had, if all the Muslims sitting together with the Prophet Sallallahu as if they want to learn from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, right? And he was there. And there were a group of people, there are other companions. How come not one of those group of companions mentioned the same hadith? The same goes Abu Huraira. Abu Huraira said that they are, he was with, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was with a group of people. It might be the same event which is Salah Batha. Well, uh, the hadith of Abu Huraira said here, right? The Abu, Huraira said, uh, the Abu Huraira never said that he witnessed the event. He just said that once when the Prophet was sitting with his companions, right? So, 
uh, this hadith, it seems that Abu Hurairah took it from other companions. He did not witness that event itself. So it might be the same event that is narrated in this hadith. But this hadith, right, witnessed by many companions, but not a single of those companions narrate the same story. So it's very, very, very strange. And furthermore, al Abbas was a non-Muslim during that time. So if the person who forged this hadith, right, who created this hadith, he might be careless. He did not did his homework well. He did not do his homework well. He did not know that al Abbas was still a non-Muslim when the Prophet ﷺ was in Mecca and in al -Bathha. So if you want to create a false hadith, you have to, you have to be smart. Right? But there are a lot of red flags uh, in both hadiths of Abu Hurairah and Al Abbas that, that can uh, that inform us that these two hadiths are highly, 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 highly suspicious that to the point that we can actually safely reject them as a work of forgery. It does not, both of them, right, do not come from the Prophet. Prophet uh, but unfortunately, right, these two hadiths that talk about the distance between the heavens and the distance between earth under us, right? And it was accepted by the people uh, in the past because there is actually their worldview, but actually we know now it's not, not the truth. But unfortunately, some people, even some scholars, right, uh, just blindly copied this hadith, just blindly narrated this hadith and shared this hadith. It is as if they, they, are, they are not aware of astronomy. They are not aware of geography. Or they are still holding to the false uh, worldview of people in the past that the earth is flat. The flat others, right? And then after that, all of them under it are all these layers of earth. Uh, so uh, it is said. Right? And then they start to they still propagate this hadith. And then people start to make mockery of this. And people do not make mockery of Islam. They make mockery of the Prophet Wasallam. And those enemies of Islam will accuse you. Say, Look, you Muslims, right? your Prophet says something that is nonsense. That is not based on reality. How can under us and under earth? And then we try very hard to defend this hadith. We fail because this hadith, right? Uh, we can safely say it's a work of forgery. Uh, so, you see... Uh, it is not actually easy to accept hadith. So the guideline is this, right? The guideline is this. Any hadith that is fantastic in nature, fantastic in content, and it concerns belief, we must be very careful. We do not accept it 100% without any investigation. We have to investigate. We have to ask people who, who know this, uh, who know the sciences of hadith, so have knowledge about it. But if the hadith talks about some good deeds that you can do, right? No, if you do this good, this, 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 this ibadah is encouraged, this and that, right? We disregard the rewards. It might be the rewards are fantastic or a work of forgery. Somebody create a false story on the rewards itself. But an ibadah is an ibadah. We are encouraged to do as much ibadah as we want, as we can. And let's say, for example, for example, Let's say we find a hadith that says that anyone who do khatam al-Quran every Thursday night or Friday night, right, uh, you know, malam Jumaat, right, we call it as Thursday night lah in English, right, uh, will be, will receive salvation from hellfire. Okay. There's no hadith on that. But let's say there's a hadith. Does it stop us from striving to do khatam al-Quran every Thursday night? Or Friday morning, no. It's still a virtue to do it, but we do not think much on the reward. The reward might be a work of forgery, so we say it's okay. We forego whatever the rewards being mentioned. We just do it for the sake of ibadah. Just like Salat Taraweh, you know, in the past, in the 70s and 80s, right, uh, I still remember some mosques, or a lot of a number of mosques, they printed this pamphlet right, that contains the virtues of doing Taraweh together in Jama'ah at mosque, 20 raka'at for every night. So first night, if you do it, it is like you have the rewards of Nabi Musa alayhi salam. Second, you'll be married with so many bidadaris. 
right in heaven what, what if you are a woman how can you go you you want to marry another bidadari in heaven so it is very a sexist uh, pamphlet right uh, just from the point of your man uh, and and the third night is in all the way to the 30th night it is a false hadith it is what do you call it a work of forgery people created that hadith right it's not true but does it stop us from doing travel every night no so we disregard the rewards the rewards are there and we leave it to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward us for our ibadah but we do our ibadah sincerely but when it comes to belief system just like these two hadith oh, oh wait a minute we do not accept 100 just like that right if the content is fantastic or the content is against what we know of reality right now right we do not negate reality just because we want to support a hadith that is problematic and people will laugh at us right because reality is something that we cannot reject so uh i shared this hadith in my book because it's, both of these hadith are very popular uh, so from this analysis we can safely say that no okay we reject these two hadith we only accept the third hadith and that is the hadith of isra miraj and that does not contain any fantastic stories of seven heavens or seven earth or the distance between the heavens and so forth and that is authentic from the prophet so i said and the prophet so i said we never go to those fantastic stories okay all right i stop here i exceed the time alhamdulillah we have done our analytical uh, analysis uh, critical analysis of the two hadith uh, let's see if there's any uh, what do you call it questions in the chat box no no questions chat box okay so thank you very much i'll see you next week again same channel same time we're going to continue our discussion on the creations of the seven heavens according to islamic narration Okay, thank you. And we end with the speaker of Allah and Suratul Asr. Subhanakum wa bika ashiru ala ilaha ila ila astaghfiruka. Tuhu bilaik. Wal asr inna insana la fi khusr ila ladhina amun wa amun salihat wa tawasu abil haqqi wa tawasu abil sabr. Right. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.